All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our 420-2021 edition of Bull Sessions. My name is Mark Robertson. I'm joined here by Ken Kavula and Kim Butcher. Say hello, guys. Hello, guys. Hi hello, to you, Kim. Guys. Or in the, in the way, ways of Stephen Graham, I guess we can reverse the words and all that kind of stuff. I do find some of his more recent uh, posts to be YouTube videos to be quite entertaining. Um, today's session is kind of all about the madness of what's going on in the market right now. It's not something that we have uh, not seen before. I know that's bad grammar, but you guys know what I meant. Um, these type of things happen uh, on a fairly regular and frequent basis in the stock market. Uh, it does happen to be that day that uh, the marijuana advocates out there celebrate as 420, hence the invasion of the, the green plants across the middle of your screen. And uh, I did ask the panelists for their uh, favorite munchies. So we're celebrating favorite munchies here with uh, uh, Kim. Kim comes in solid for the, the chocolate chip cookies. This is not something that can be argued with. No. <laughs> that looks like a pretty good stack there, Kim. You're you're probably loaded up and ready to go. No, oh, yeah, I made some yesterday. <laughs> and my favorite pizza, which some have accused of being lasagna, especially if you're from anywhere other than Chicago, is Giordano's spinach deep dish pizza that you see there on the left. And uh, it's it's quite good. You can get it in the meat variety also, but uh, Pretty substantial. I treated Ken to one of those on our most recent visit to Chicago. I think you enjoyed it, Ken. Yes, it was certainly a unique taste experience. Uh -huh. It really is very lasagna-like, yeah. And we are gonna talk about pastrami here in a few minutes, and I have to share one of our other road adventures here. I'll let Ken pay homage to one of his favorite places to handle any munchies that might set in. Well, I grew up about two miles away from one of the Corky and Lenny's, which is a, a real old fashioned Jewish delicatessen. Um, the neighborhood that I grew up in is uh, about a mile and a half, two miles from uh, a huge Jewish neighborhood. Um, and there, uh, I grew up eating, eating all kinds of, of kosher food and just loving the heck out of it. So uh, I took Mark to Corky and Lenny's the last time we spoke in in Cleveland, and and I think he had an experience like he's never had before. I think it was yeah, was a, a kind of a new sensation for him. It was it was delicious, and that that sandwich picture is a pretty close characterization of uh, what I experienced. And uh, it's it's actually making me hungry again right now. Yeah, good stuff. It's, so. uh, it's a great place. There's five or six of them in the Cleveland area. If you get a chance to be in that area, look up Corky and Lenny's, and you. They have uh, sassy waitresses and great food. So, <laughs> yeah, it was it was great, no doubt about it. So with that, Susan, Susan Zaleski has her hand up. Susan, I'm going to unmute you and let you make whatever comment you'd like to make. Uh, you're self muted, Susan, so you'll have to unmute yourself. And that maybe is an inadvertent hand, so I'm going to take the hand down. And continue, Mark. Yep, and attendees are welcome to, to enter in the comments field any favorite munchies that you might have. Uh, let's go ahead and get the legal paperwork out of the way. No investment recommendation is intended. No munchie recommendation is intended here. Um, this is all about education. Uh, illustration, demonstration, these are all keywords in what we do. We are fueled and inspired by the modern investment club movement. And... Uh, the lessons that have been learned over the last 80-ish years by the modern investment club movement. And keep in mind that any opinions are our own. We do attempt to share. We try, try to remember to share when we are a stakeholder in the situation. Um, and we will try to do that. We hold a monthly roundtable. The next one is a week from today. So next uh, Tuesday's bull session will include a look back four years ago at whatever was on our mind at the roundtable. Um, by the way, uh, Kim and I were noticing earlier this morning that the internal rate of return for the roundtable now is up to 19.3% since inception. That's since July 2010. So uh, some of those selections have worked out quite nicely for us over the years. If you'd like to be invited to those sessions, they happen on 
Tuesday evenings at 8.30 Eastern Time, usually the last Tuesday of the month, you can send a request to be sent a reminder uh, to nkabula1 at comcast.net. If you would like copies of slides or if you have follow-up questions or suggestions for things you want to see us talk about, please send me an email at markr at manifestinvesting.com. Any other cleanup on aisle four, Ken? Uh, no, I think we're going to get into the the conference here just in a couple slides, right? Yeah, it, it comes comes around here somewhere. Okay, great. All right, here's my boomer service announcement because I, I, I plead guilty. I had no idea what Bill Meyer was talking about on TV when he's he's running around giggling about 420. Um, so I just thought I would share with the audience where some of that reference comes from. It has become quite the the symbol or icon for the uh, affirmative marijuana movement in the United States. And I don't know, Ken, did you have any, any influence in, in your youth into this uh, movement early on? No, Ken, well, just say this, no comment. Not this particular movement, but <laughs> I, I will tell you that I went to college in the late 60s. That's when marijuana first became something that was sweeping the college age generation. And uh, so I understand. I really think, Mark, that a lot of the vocabulary is much more geographically localized than Bill Maher would like to admit. I think he's showing his age when he thinks it's standardized uh, vocabulary. Oh, and, and, he, and just evidence that perhaps he didn't get out much when he was uh, or even to Well, he's a, <laughs> he's a California guy, and California guys and California girls seem to think that the world revolves around California. I'm, I'm probably offending people from the Golden State that are listening if we have anybody in the audience, but no. uh, you know, there, there is a lot of land between the East Coast and the West Coast that, that a lot of the coasters just fly over on the way from one coast to the other. And uh, we have a lot to, to offer and a lot to talk about. And uh, I'm, I'm positive that the vocabulary is, is much more geographical yeah. than than just this uh, reference here. Kim, you had a comment? Oh, I was just gonna say that um, Ken should not admit to anything like <laughs> any of good. I didn't admit to anything, you Kim. Didn't. I was saying, good job there. And um, let's just say the first concert I went to ever was the Doobie Brothers, and I won't say anything more. <laughs> okay. Good stuff. All right. And then, well, Kim, the second concert I ever went to was Richard Pryor. So, uh, oh, oh man, okay. man. All right. And so that was my boomer service announcement. This is a public service announcement. Uh, this is just a just an FYI. I am not taking sides on this debate. I I am literally neutral. I do think that there's probably more to the story that's out there and I'm what I'm featuring here. I do have personal experience with this situation. I have taken a person that is close to me to the emergency room five times uh, for uncontrolled vomiting. Basically think of it as morning sickness on steroids. And uh, I would just encourage the audience to, to become familiar with some of the other stuff that's going on. It's it's not a harmless situation, just like anything else in, in life. Um, again, I'm not advocating one position or the other. This is just simply a public service announcement because uh, there actually have been deaths associated with this uh, morning sickness on steroids. And it's just something to be aware of. Hospitals, and Kim can probably attest to this, emergency rooms are seeing cases of this. and uh, it's just something to be aware of and understand because someone close to you could actually come down with this syndrome and it's it's incredibly nasty and life-threatening any comment kim no i mean the uh, public service announcement says it all because you know you put a big red circle around kidney failure electrolyte problems and skin burns uh those all can be life-threatening and um what you don't know can hurt you and you know throwing up get your electrolytes out of whack and uh, some people had actually thought that marijuana would help your nausea but it can also do the opposite it can make it worse so it's it's always great to be knowledgeable and i 
uh, think it's great that we're giving a public service announcement out there because there are a lot of people who think uh, what smoking Mary Jane or MJ is like no biggie. It can be. Yeah, and I, I, again, I think it falls into the category of be informed. And the book by Alex Berenson, who's a, a former New York Times journalist, uh, his wife happens to be a, a psychiatrist who deals with this firsthand, uh, running into situations that many younger people have. So we'll just leave it at that. Take a take a look at it. Uh, one of the reasons that kind of caught my attention is I had not ever heard anybody talk about this in any form of media until just last week when Alex Berenson brought it up in this interview. So that's why it's there. All right, back to uh, investing. We are gonna talk a little bit about investing in the cannabis uh, phenomenon, but uh, here are some of the topics that we have committed to cover in future sessions. Today, we'll take a look at, we do have a new sheriff in town. Uh, we wanna relive that $4 million moment, which happened two days after last week's session where we warned you that Tin Cup was getting up there. Apparently it's not up there today. Uh, I haven't actually looked, but we're probably well back under 4 million now. So we'll get to celebrate again when we break 4 million again. I wanna talk a little bit about Dogecoin, doggy coin or whatever you wanna call it. And then as Ken was alluding to in the green room, we have seen periods of uh, irrationality before. And we'll actually go back to the not quite to Ken's youth, but the mid 1990s, and talk about Alex Green, Alan Greenspan, and uh, here's that comment, Ken, about the the deli, the the pastrami must be amazing, and we'll take a look at the actual fundamentals behind that one, and just uh, the cannabis environment in general. So let's go ahead and get rolling. Here is, uh, you know, I was getting teased in the green room for those of you that are just joining us about my name not being on the li this list, and Ken. Uh, Ken is in there in the top 20, actually ranked 22nd, but three of those are, are Rhino, so he's actually 19th. And uh, Kim, you're not on here yet either, but you know, with enough massaging of the math, we can probably get, get into this at some point. But uh, I did want to celebrate the fact that we do have a new sheriff. Uh, Joseph O'Brien did slip back just a tiny bit, and the lead has been assumed by Ty Hughes of the Moose Pond Investment Club in the greater Washington, D.C. area. So Ty has been around in manifest circles for over 10 years and uh, just want to tip our hat in his general direction along with that. Those reminders that I get virtually every day that, gee, there's another nine months to go in this contest, so so cool your jets, Mark, um, that sort of thing. Overall numbers improving in general, and Kathy Wood is still, and it's probably even worse now with Tesla dropping, uh, she's still bringing up the end of the pack. So Ken, go ahead and bask in your moment. <laughs> I I'm, uh, brought the news to the Mid-Michigan Model Club last night when we met that uh, we were doing uh, quite well in the contest. And what's unique about the B.I. Baker entry to your contest, Mark, and the Mid-Michigan entry is that it's uh, nothing more than a list of the stocks that we held on February 1st, uh, ranked in par order, and then uh, we picked the 10 top or the 10 highest pars from the list and submitted those as the entries. So this is a partial portfolio of both these model clubs, and uh, it, it speaks to, to how strong these model club portfolios actually are. Yeah, oh my gosh, that means you guys are up basically 20% since February. I mean, wow, or, you know, on the order of 20% anyhow. Wow. And here's Ken. So the the Knights of the Round Table are represented. Kim and I are just off the list. I didn't look at the actual numbers. But we're, 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 we're a three. No, no, but Mark, we're, we're at 21, the Round Table. We present stocks well, yeah, in there. So yeah, we're okay. that's our consensus selection. So we're we're in there. We're represented, Ken. You, you can you can try to to cast uh, aspersions in our directions, but we're we're there, Ken. Mark is the thirteenth entry. Lisa Robertson is that a relative? No, but she's a, a volunteer for the Puget Sound chapter out in Washington. The Puget Sound, okay. You've met her. Right. You've met her out there. I probably have. It just mm -hmm. the last name didn't didn't ring a bell at that point. Yeah. You know, if push comes to shove and she needs a little extra help with the last name of Robertson, that's a good good uh, feather in her cap. All right, 
And here's a look at Ty Hughes' selections for this year. This is pretty uh, uh, mindful, or it resembles the Jim Cramer turnaround portfolio in some ways. He basically picked a bunch of companies that, that seemed to be doing well economically and were poised well for an improving economy, including some of the travel stocks that you see there, some of uh, Hugh McManus's energy stocks there, including BP, but hotels, cruise lines, uh, home builders, um, airlines. And interestingly enough, the weakest one in the portfolio has probably got the strongest outlook as Axos Financial at the bottom. So I think uh, Ty is probably a, a force to be reckoned with in future months, even though we do have nine months to go on this. I, I really like it when folks put 10 entries into their contest portfolio because then not only can we look at all the other numbers but we can look at how much the individuals have grown as well i mean because they started out with a hundred thousand each and you just drop off the one and you have the percentage growth going on so lgi homes up 55 plus percent since uh the the first of or second of february it, that's just amazing 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 yeah, and, yeah when... and I always think it's amazing that I'm the one who brought it to the attention at the um, <laughs> convention and then at round table, and it didn't even hit my radar. <laughs> Good stuff. Well, congratulations, Ty, and, and Godspeed going forward. All right. Just one quick reminder that uh, we talked about it briefly a week ago, and two days later, we did reach uh, another million dollar milestone. Uh, in the tin cup, I, I, I look now and it's down to three million nine twenty, so it's been shaved off a little bit. But the reason I, I wanted to include this one is just just some context. Uh, this thing started back in 1995, basically end of 1994, uh, which kind of mirrors my entire career of investing. By the way, uh, got started with the investment club a couple years before that. But notice that the first milestone was reached in 2012. Uh, so 17 plus years, and then the next two, the next million dollars was piled on in, in approximately six years, 2018, and then the next one came a, uh, two and a half years later in 2020, and then lo and behold, with the madness that's gone on in the market over the last year, uh, what is that? Six months, six months to hit the four thousand, uh, the four million. So I mean, that's just astounding. So. Ken, much like that first million that you uh, passed a while back, that first million is the toughest, and then you just pile them on after that, right? Yeah, they just keep coming, Mark. So, <laughs> uh, Ken, can you give us some guidance? Does that mean that the time frame cuts in half every time you get another million? I think I think Mark said what twelve to six to three, and then are you, are you alluding to my age again, Kim? Is that what you're doing? <laughs> <laughs> I think we should go to the next slide, Mark. This is right. really interesting, but let's look at the next slide. Yeah. She's picking on our ages again. Okay. All right. All right. So in, there are cases where you don't have to wait two months or six months or, or in some cases, 15 minutes. Uh, I don't know how closely you have followed this, Ken, but this Dogecoin um, is all over the press. I didn't even really want to talk about it, but it's kind of hard to ignore that picture. Um, I have people well, go ahead. My grandson tells me that, and uh, somebody younger in the audience might verify this. My grandson tells me that Dogecoin started out as a uh, a currency within a game. Is that correct? Does anybody know that for certain? That's true, and it was literally a joke. It was actually okay. poking fun. It was uh, uh, an analyst programmer at Adobe that actually did it, and then somebody picked it up and uh, if, if you want a good overview, if you're not familiar with Graham Stephan, that YouTube link down at the bottom, he's a riot. It's about a 10 or 12 minute video where he gives you the history and, and talks about this. And he starts off the video with saying he invested a thousand dollars in, I'm calling it doggy coin. I know it's not functionally correct, but it, it's doggy coin to me. Uh, so a thousand dollars into doggy coin uh, about a year ago would be worth $89,000. And then he admits that he, he sold it six months ago. And then he goes and jumps in his pool with his clothes on. Now, now tell me, Mark, how do you invest in Dogecoin? 
you can have, most of the major brokers uh, have direct access and you can buy it just like you would buy any type of currency. It's just like buying a stock, basically. Um, it's pretty easy to do. I do have a family member who bought a bunch of it uh, a, li a little over a month or so ago at about a nickel. So 0 0.05, do you see here? Somewhere back in this time frame, five cents. And it's now up to 40 cents. So his he's up eight times what he invested in. He only invested like $1,000, but still that's like $7,000 out of nowhere. Uh, and that was when it was around here. And it's, it has continued to soar. I mean, it's it's just a, it's an amazing thing. And, you know, Stefan makes the, the point that all of the Bitcoin stuff and some of the Ethereum and there's various kinds of cryptocurrencies, they're very intimidating. And for those of us in this room, I got to believe the vast majority of us are very uncomfortable with the notion that there's no fundamentals here. There's no underlying value in reality, no intrinsic value. Uh, this is not what we do. But uh, um, Kathy Wood just ran a session on how it is being implemented in institutional accounts on behalf of investors. Um, it's, it's just fascinating, I would say. Just become familiar with it and at least understand the, the scenario, um, even if it's a bit challenging to understand what in the world's going on here. Uh, there was a very interesting discussion, Mark, about 12, 15 minutes of it uh, on, a, on a morning program today on CNBC, uh, talking about the brand new Chinese uh, cryptocurrency that's actually backed by the government and uh, drawing distinctions between uh, it and some of the other cryptocurrencies, uh, how they're the same, how they're different, uh -huh. uh, whether it's a challenge to anything in the world, is it a store of value, what can you do with it, et cetera. And uh, they promised that they were gonna take that uh, discussion, which uh, really was, was quite well done. Uh, it goes about 12 or 13 or 14 minutes, like I said, and they were going to put that uh, in a, uh, a snippet on the CNBC website. So if that kind of uh, thing is interesting to you, uh, if China has done this, I would not hesitate to guess that other nations will follow for one reason or another. Uh, there were a lot of negatives attached to this uh, as far as what the government could do, uh, especially if they chose to move those currencies uh, uh, and add rules to the currency over and above the rules that are attached to to physical currency. Uh, one of the things they talked about was, and that China had even mentioned was that in the cryptocurrency, they could actually put a limit uh, as to uh, how long it was valid, how long it could be used. Hmm. Uh, and that could be a way to uh, offer direct stimulus and then guarantee that it was going to be used for something in a, in a certain amount of time. Uh, they also talked about how trackable it was with modern uh, machinery, modern intelligence, uh, how easy it would, would be to track money flows of individuals within the country. Uh, so that it's, a, it's something to think about. Uh, one of the gentlemen uh, brought, that was brought on uh, talked about it was his biggest nightmare. Uh, so uh, I, I think that, that it behooves us uh, if things are going to change as rapidly as they've been changing in the next five years, I think we have to get educated on some of these things. We have to begin to understand them. Uh, Dwight is making the comment that that he's just uh, uh, not comprehending cryptocurrency, NTFs, and all the other things that go into it. I think you have a, a slide later on, Mark, that makes fun of SPACs and other things. And I think that's the world that a lot of us are living in right now, that the rules are changing so rapidly and we don't know what rules are going to actually survive and which rules are, are going to be found to be ridiculous and, and, and leave, you know. So it's um, CNBC, it was a discussion uh, this morning uh, about the Chinese cryptocurrency. Okay, I'll, I'll definitely look that up and see if I can add it to, uh, to our discussions. And I'll, I'll just say, Kim, any any global thoughts on this from where you stand? I know I don't understand it, so I need to learn about it. But 
it's I'm having a very hard time wrapping my head around it. I know that the book that I had mentioned, Layered Money, talks about what it's about. And the biggest thing that I can get from it was um, people have to have trust in it to want to use it. And um, the question is, is will people trust it? And then um, will there be, because people want to use it, uh, currency cannot then probably get manipulated by different countries. But when if you got something going on out of China now, I, that and they're going to control that that's another form of manipulation so it's i don't know mm -hmm. it, it's in other words we have we it's, it's something we need to learn yeah i will confess oh. that uh i've been doing a lot of work in the gaming area trying to understand the stuff that kim has brought to us on in the worldwide gaming phenomenon and what i i think i have discovered is that ethereum which is another cryptocurrency is is directly related to gaming and that uh this Ethereum is definitely in the in the blockchain mode of stuff. So it's 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 got a number of different areas that I want to understand better. And I have been tracking Ethereum as a potential purchase. The ticker on it is ETH. Uh, if you want to look it up um, and see if your brokerage firm trades it, just to just to track it. So it's it's something. I mean, I'm I'm I, I was I was half joking about coming up with our own currency with a groundhog or a, uh, a smiling bull on it. So, you know, it's, it's, it's weird. Just accept that it's weird, but try to try your best to understand it. And well, the point was, the point was made many times uh, today in the discussion that just because you add the word crypto in front of the word currency, doesn't mean you're talking about the same thing. Just as in the late 90s, when you added a dot com to the end of a word, it didn't necessarily mean it had anything to do with with Internet or, or anything else other than than uh, fashion. You know, uh, Matt is making the point uh, out in the audience right now. Matt Spielman is making the point that uh, the European Union uh, is expected to, to decide by mid 2021, which is coming up in a couple of months now whether or not to launch a digital euro. So right, uh, right. the European Union might be following. Uh, and again, that would be something not necessarily the same as a cryptocurrency, but there would be overlapping things that would be involved with it probably. And, and maybe it's not so far. I mean, I, I see my family trading around with Venmo all the time. So, you know, this old dog might learn a few new things. You never know. Apparently, you can Venmo cash to just about anybody. All right. Nick wants you to go ahead, Mark, with the Groundhog Crypto Blockchain Currency. <laughs> uh, and he wants all Manifest members to have a an interest at the startup. Okay? So okay. he wants you to divvy up a, a, a zero uh, value interest at the very beginning to all Manifest investors. So... Uh, we would like each one of us would like 500 of those crypto coins. Okay. All right. I, I, I mean, it's not out of the realm of trying to come up with a demonstration that would help explain this. I am not kidding when I say, you know, if, if I found a way to, to link it to a subscription or something to help understand, um, it's not out of the realm of possibility. That's for sure. And, and with the luck that, that, uh, some of us have Mark, uh, you'd probably end up being the poster child for the SEC to go after the whole industry, you know? <laughs> all right. Well, all I can say to that is bring it, bring it. <laughs> all right. Just a reminder that, you know, things are crazy. The recent New York uh, magazine cover uh, that Ken mentioned a few minutes ago, um, things are a little bit wacky, but it's not the first time. Um, I remember the day back in 1996, it was actually December 5th. 1996, when Alan Greenspan uh, made that comment about irrational exuberance. And uh, uh, long story short, the markets continued to soar for another four years before taking a breather. But in, even more importantly, I thought I would provide the context of since he made that comment, the stock market has gone up 9.5% as measured by the Wilshire 5000 since that day nearly 25 years ago. 
So I, I think there's some tremendous context in there. That's that magic 10% number that just keeps appearing over the long term. And as ebullient, you see the manic ebullience down there. What a what a phrase. Um, we've we've been here before. And SPACs, I, th I think we mentioned a few weeks ago, Berkshire Hathaway was a SPAC. They just didn't call it that. Um, Non-fungible tokens. Uh, I'll tell you what, if any, any of you want to buy an image from Manifest Investing for for $88,000 or something like that, I'm, I'm willing to part with it. How about, would you agree, Ken? Uh, yeah, as long as I get my share, Mark, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and and again, folks, I don't have any ties uh, financially to manifest investing, so don't uh, don't tell me that I own it, a piece of the company. Okay, it would be a gratuity, Ken. A gratuity, okay. A gratuity. Uh, Sean is making the point that you could think of these things like credit cards that came out in the fifties. Uh, you have to trust the company or crypto you are using. The only problem I see with that, Sean, is that when I used a credit card in the 50s, yes, I am that old to have had credit cards in the late 50s. Well, they were my mother's, but uh, but when I used a credit card, I got something that I could hold in my hand in exchange for giving them that credit card. The trust wasn't on me. The trust was on the merchant that they could then uh, get the money from me at some later date, uh, get something else that we had to trust at value for in order for it to work. That's currency. So I, I don't think that it's a it, that's a, a, a real good uh, example of how this stuff works today, because when you buy a Dogecoin or a Bitcoin or a piece of Ethereum, uh, you don't get anything. Uh, they just tell you you have it. That's it. And it's nothing you can hold. It's nothing you can see. And in some cases, it's not even very easy to check uh, where it's supposed to be deposited or, or vaulted or whatever you want to say. Sean says as a follow-up, uh, yeah, but remember how much the credit card companies have made since that point as well. And that's a uh, well taken, point well taken. They've They've been extremely profitable and uh, I bet a lot of us have Visa and uh, MasterCard and other other things in their portfolios that we have to today. Dwayne says, "Listen to Sean." Okay. <laughs> and and I, gonna, do, I do listen closely, even if I give him a hard time on a on a regular basis. I'm gonna unmute Marlene. Marlene has her hand up. Marlene, uh, you are self muted. So you need to unmute yourself, but then you can speak. Okay. I just want to tell you, I haven't had time to read it, but there's a section today in the Wall Street Journal that explains Bitcoins. Uh, it looked kind of interesting. It's a couple of pages. So whoever, you know, can either read it online or get it. But uh, I just wanted to let you know. I will take a look at that. And I would also point out that Barron's had an extensive feature that I have not read yet uh, a week ago in Barron's magazine. Well, we have a... a break right here. I'm going to unmute Dennis. Uh, Dennis uh, Roman. Dennis, you're self-muted. You'll have to unmute and then you can speak to us. Uh, probably an inadvertent hand, so I'm going to take Dennis's hand down. Okay, okay uh, Mark, uh, we can continue. All right, are you ready to talk about Amazing Pastrami? This is actually yeah. from uh, David Einhorn, by the way, is in third place, well, actually fourth place in this year's Groundhog Challenge representing Greenlight Capital. He's been in the contest every year, and uh, his overall performance over the last 14 years is uh, is not good. Uh, he's, he had a couple spectacular years, but taken in total, uh, it hasn't been good, but he isn't in fourth place this year. He is the, the leading groundhog. That's David on the upper right. And in his recent letter to shareholders, which if you if you just do a search on it, you can find it, um, he basically made the comment that this particular company, uh, which he brings out as uh, an example of some of the madness going on right now, that the pastrami must be amazing. Because that is a that is a picture of the business. They've not made a profit in uh, the last five or six years for sure, and probably not before that. And uh, 
yeah, they've had uh, a year off due to COVID. They were basically shut down for the last quarter of 2020, but they were still headed in a pretty nasty direction. And this particular company has gone from a stock price of $1 up to a, a high of, I believe, fourteen fifty. And those 7 million shares outstanding means that the company was in theory worth $100 million. Um, it's just kind of hard to imagine. Uh, you mean the pictures are there? I mean, I put the pastrami over the PE ratio because there isn't one. And uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating situation. Um, as you dig in a little bit deeper, you find a, the word Macau as a province of China in there pretty prominently and you find out that uh the father of the ceo who happens to be the high school wrestling coach um is as a three hundred thousand dollar per year contract and it just becomes quite fascinating um i'd love to extrapolate this to manifest investing terms and find out how much ken and i could uh, uh royal the world for i mean ken i can hire you for a few million dollars a year under this model apparently and not have a problem just amazing. So I, I think it's just an example of you know, Einhorn brings this to the attention of you know the public that there are these type of things out there. This I think dovetails into the, our discussions a few weeks ago about the China hustle and finding our a small you know companies that you can basically reverse uh, enter the domestic U.S. market. So that that's what this slide's about, Ken. Any any reactions? Any guttural reactions? I just uh, was wondering if if this has fallen in the same trap that uh, a lot of the Reddit stocks have fallen into. Is this highly shorted, perhaps, and somebody trying to to uh, do an end run around the shorts? I, I just it doesn't make any sense to me. So, and when that happens, I don't. I'm not very interested in it as an investment. So. No, no, I'm not calling it out as an investment. I'm just saying that how. Yeah. Uh, short or long and it's just amazing and, and kim kim you can probably speak to some of the fine print well i did go to the sec website and i looked at the financials and all i had to do was look at it for i don't know two or three minutes and i went this makes no sense whatsoever so i'm avoiding it and the next thought i had is what are they doing laundering money or something it sure it sure seems to resemble laundering as I understand laundering and and uh, uh, I don't know I, I think this falls into the category of uh, there's a lot of enforcement to be done Ken as we were talking a few minutes ago and it just it's one of those wow moments. Well, I I do hope that that uh, with the change in administration comes a little bit of effort to beef up the the abilities that the SEC has to help us follow some of the rules that are already in place. Uh, I know that there was an, uh, I, I wouldn't say an active attempt, but I know that in the last uh, administration, the SEC uh, became weaker than it had traditionally been, so. All right, we'll stop talking so, about them because we don't want them paying attention to, to us either. Uh, Mark, I'm gonna stop you and try Dennis again because he is trying to speak to us, so Dennis, uh, if you will unmute yourself, there you go. Now you can speak, Dennis. Hey, Dennis. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks so much. This is a very just a soundbite. People were wondering how do I buy cryptos if I wanted to, and the two easiest ways would be to either download the Coinbase app or the Voyager app. Either one, both wonderful, uh, off the App Store, and just fire up an account and fund it. Um, and all of the cryptos, hundreds of them, are all listed right there. They trade 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's very easy to do if you're in, if you're motivated to want to do that. My only uh, my only predicament was they won't they won't connect to Charles Schwab. They ch they connect to most big banks, but they won't connect to Schwab. So interesting. Um, that's the one bank you can, and when I go to Schwab to try to buy uh, crypto, they won't sell me any. So anyway, Schwab is off the chart, but if you got a regular old bank like Wells or anybody else, you could fund your account from your bank account and and just go buy $100 of a dot zero 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 one. 
crypto and wait for it to go to zero zero one zero and you'll be rich. <laughs> well, That's I'm telling you, on. I mean, I have relatives who did this. What you're looking here on on Doggy Coin, they did this, and I, I thanks for bringing that up, Dennis, because it actually brings kind of closure to what we've been talking about. You you can't you can't help but take this seriously in some regard. The Coinbase company that Dennis just mentioned came public last week at a market capitalization of $85 billion. Um, that is just, I mean, that is more than I, I believe 20% of the S&P 500 can. Uh, so it, it, it can't be ignored. It just simply can't be ignored. Uh, Sean keeps wanting to say something, so I'm going to unmute Sean here. And Sean, yourself muted as well. Uh, yes, actually, when, in regards to that, oh, can you hear me now? Yep, can hear you, Sean. All right. So uh, in regards to that, um, what's funny about it is Dogecoin, uh, or you can actually purchase futures through Schwab. You don't Sean, have to. You can't trade the actual coin itself. Uh, Sean, I'm going to interrupt you. Uh, you have a radio or a TV going. Can you turn it down? Yeah, sorry there. It's so, with you. Okay, go ahead. Sorry there. So you can actually um, purchase futures through Schwab. You do, you can't purchase the coins outright, but you can purchase the um, Bitcoin futures through Schwab if you'd like to. Also, I wanted to note that the um, the trades for Doge for any cryptocurrency they're twenty four seven as well, and they're not regulated at all. So there are a lot of pump and dump schemes going on with it. So it's just something to be to be aware of, especially with Dogecoin. Um, um, happening right now because the same thing happened in what 2017 when Bitcoin hit 20,000 and then it just collapsed to like 13,000. Sean, I, I do have a question for you. Are they subject, are these places uh, that we're talking about, these exchanges, are they subject to the reporting rules so that if I would make $100,000 uh, that gets reported to the IRS as a capital gain? Uh, no, because they are not. Um, require they're not technically employers like robin hood would do it because they're they're as a they're a trader you can buy dogecoin through robin hood um but they're, they're designated as a trader through the sec um but like coin coinbase they may have to now just because now they're regulated by the um um i'm sorry I apologize, uh, by the exchanges but other platforms might not have the same regulatory requirements um to send out a 1099 for you and that's why it was a big problem with the irs back in the day to hey do you have any bitcoin did you sell any bitcoin did you make any money off of it and a lot of people were able to avoid a lot of taxes because none of it was regulated through uh and or 1099s were not sent in either okay well it's, it's so also that, interesting so that it, oh, it's the wild wild west is what it is then right yeah it's also interesting oh. to note that the new in fact the new sheriff in town at the sec is Gary Gensler, and somebody asked him, what what are these cryptocurrencies? Are they securities, equities, or currency? And his answer to that question was yes. And who knows what that means? So we'll see. All right. Are we ready to press on, Ken? Uh, yes, we are, Mark. Yes, we are. All right. Let's go ahead and close up with a couple of things we had talked about, including our tribute to the the cannabis craze um i had mentioned a few weeks ago about this investment that i have tracked for the better part of 30 years this thing called cuba and the ticker symbol is actually cuba and you'll notice that over the last 10 years or so it's delivered about a six percent return actually lagging the market by nine percent and uh, we just made kind of the left-handed comment that it was might be interesting to study because of the content, what it's actually composed of. And I'm pretty sure we called out Maztec. It's a good study. Uh, Ken has actually had, had it active in some of his clubs recently. But you can see that there are some fairly household names in this. And uh, my reason for following it was just this notion that if Cuba were ever to open up and become part of the you know, capital picture in the United States and the world, it, it could be quite, a, quite an event. And uh, what I wanted to put into context, and first, uh, an admission that I missed this again uh, last November. I'll tell you what I mean by that in a second. But the purple line is the, the Cuba fund that you can see here in this long-term chart going back approximately 20 years. 
And uh, when it was thought that uh, President Obama at the time was taking the lead in the Democratic primaries back in the, the 2008 election time frame, you can see that th there was quite a run up in the value of this Cuba fund, again, anticipating the possibility that that Cuba could become part of the, the at least Western hemisphere economy. And then that same thing happened again about midway through President Obama's second term, where they did attempt to normalize relations with Cuba uh, quite a bit. And uh, my thinking at the time, this was back in uh, late summer, early autumn, uh, prior to the election was, maybe it was time to go back again. And I wish I had remembered to actually do it because before the election a few months ago, uh, this was down around $3, and it actually has outperformed the market over the last several months. The reason I bring it up here is I, I still have the, the impression that we could have a, another one of these moments in front of us. Uh, just this past weekend, Raul Ca Castro actually stepped down, and uh, there's a lot of thinking that, you know, even coming in to help with the COVID uh, situation in Cuba and a variety of things, it just might kick some doors open. And if that were to happen, might we get a spike? Might we already have that spike in progress? I don't know, but I did buy a few shares of it just in case that there is a tick up. But um, one of the other points that we made is, again, going down that list, there's a number of companies we've looked at as promising over the years. And uh, you're, you're reading my mind, Mark. I just am waiting to jump in on Copa Holdings there. That's a an awfully pretty SSG, folks. Uh, they operate airports, and right now they operate airports in Mexico, Central America, Northern South America, and uh, they operate the, one of the busiest airports in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, that's the one in the Yucatan Peninsula uh, that feeds into all the vacation spots in the Yucatan there. Uh, but if, uh, if Copa got a chance to go into Cuba and operate airports, uh, that certainly would be a big plus uh, to this company. That's a really pretty SSG if you're looking to uh, find companies that, uh, that that read real nice. This happens to be an ADR, but uh, I would I would say take a look at it. And uh, I'm I'm surprised and pleased to see it on a list like this. Yeah, and there's a number of interesting companies. I mean, my attention is kind of drawn to this one right here. That is a tech. Uh, a ticker, believe it or not, but it's on the Mexico exchange. Um, hard to believe that that is a six letter ticker. And uh, Cinco de Mayo is around the corner. So we'll probably have to do something with that too. There must be some thought that American home builders would move into Cuba as well. There's Lennar, just, you know, nice vanilla home builder on the list right there. Uh, it's a big home builder, one of the largest in the country, but uh, there it is sitting on the list. Uh, B.I. Baker, uh, the model club that uh, is doing quite well in the Groundhog Contest, uh, is riding Mastec right now. It's one of the best performing stocks in its portfolio, and it's a stock that I hardly ever see in any other club's portfolio. Uh, we really liked it when we did an industry study a couple years ago, and we've uh, been adding uh, to it on a pretty regular basis until fairly recently, until it's gotten to the point where it's probably uh, well into the hold zone right now, but a, a really, really uh, interesting company to to take a gander at. Uh, I also uh, like the uh, Next Era Energy, Mark, N-E-E. -E. I don't know, have you ever looked at this one? Yeah, they're, they're uh, it's, it's the old, uh, one of the Florida utilities. I don't remember exactly which one. Yeah, it's, a, it's a utility that's gotten into alternative uh, energy big time, real big time. Uh, and uh, it's it's not as pretty an SSG, but it certainly uh, has a lot in its story. And if you if your club likes to look at story stocks that might turn into uh, you know really really good earners as well, NEE might be a, a great study to put together. Well, I mean, the, the, this this particular fund also brings Kim to mind. It was, this would be her neighbor down there in central Florida. And uh, notice the number of lodging and hotel stocks there, Kim. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm still very happy with my Wyndham hotels. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised to see Wyndham on this list at some point either. 
Well, and uh, I don't know if you guys remember this, but CMEX was at the Better, Better Investing National Convention, and I will not say how long ago, but um, I did really well with that stock. Yeah, that's just and, concrete. Yeah, well, concrete infrastructure building, and the biggest thing that CMEX does in Canada, because they're out of Canada and they're here in South Florida, but or not Canada in Mexico is I was going to say yeah okay yeah, go on. well it's yeah but they distribute the 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 mix everywhere because water is everywhere but they, they are much more they don't have uh the cement trucks everywhere they just distribute it by the five pound bags yep in yep. Mexico more I remember that number one yeah, building material if you're looking for a building material play for the U.S., let alone for Cuba, uh, Martin Marietta keeps popping up in our studies in the clubs that I'm uh, a member of, this MLM. Uh, that's basically stones and aggregate. Uh, and it's uh, an another fairly decent looking SSG. Well, I know that uh, one of the clubs I talked with, um, they were saying the same thing because anytime if we get an infrastructure bill that will do well. And um, like, uh, I was really thinking that hopefully the, the stock that I presented last month at the round table road ROAD because mm -hmm. they're, they're uh, nothing but doing a lot of asphalt on the roads and all. And they're just in like a five state area. So that may really do well too. All right, so I guess we can wrap this one up. I, I also am kind of moved by the fact that this is a 6% uh, projected return on value, which is above average value, but um, it's it's a back door, maybe front door infrastructure play for sure. And uh, it could be very Mark, interesting. Mark, you, you would expect the PAR numbers to move up uh, if the Cuba suddenly opened to uh, tourism or something like that, wouldn't you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think um, yeah, you know, okay. again, on some of these companies, it would be such a small piece, but for others, it would be uh, quite substantial. I mean, the bigger picture yeah. would just be the the broad uh, opening. I, I like the, the idea, but what strikes me more than anything else is is how ordinary, and maybe that's not quite the right word, but how ordinary the top maybe 10 or 12 holdings are that uh, they could, you know, they could be you could make a case for them in almost any portfolio. They don't have to, to specifically talk about Cuba. Exactly. And that's that's why if we could get Sean to uh, get his Reddit buddies on this one, we could probably all <laughs> invest in it for infrastructure. And then we get the Reddit gang to drive it up to about 60 instead of six. <laughs> that's, your, that's on your to-do list now, Sean. Okay, well, let's let's close the day talking a little bit about uh, cannabis and marijuana. This is the ETF that has a, a number of marijuana-centric firms in it. And uh, uh, Ken and I will probably be talking about similar topics when we do our thing on theme investing. And one of the reasons I bring it up as theme investing is this notion of, you know, a couple years ago, everybody thought these were going to take off and go to the moon, to, to use a timely phrase. And in fact, back in the early days of 2019, there were a number of entrants in the Groundhog Contest, hence the Groundhog here, that uh, picked cannabis-related stocks. And every single one of those participants in that year's contest finished near the bottom of the barrel because this is what happened um, over the next year. So definitely a gigantic reset in the in the cannabis stocks during that groundhog season that was 2019 now it's been surging again you can see that it's gone from the bottom of the chart back up to where it was three four years ago and with the, the stuff that's going on on the legislative front who knows um it, it's all kind of happening and uh here, here's a look at the, the mj etf over the last year and you can see that since the election um, there's been quite a bit of exuberance. It, it got all the way up there for a while, and it's kind of settled back, uh, pausing to take a breather. But uh, 
You can see the companies that compose it. One of the things that I find interesting about this particular fund is it's it's not just the the cannabis companies, but there's things in there like Miracle Grow and uh, other types of companies as as well as uh, some of the more traditional tobacco companies. Your thoughts, Ken? We'd be remiss, Mark, if we didn't indicate that Tilray, and that's the fifth largest, fourth largest holding in this uh, fund right now, that Tilray has had a lot of people playing around with it, uh, just like GameStop, uh, and it's moved uh, to uh, heights much higher than it is trading at right now, and it uh, opened at heights much lower than it is. Tilray would be an interesting chart to to flash up here uh, right against this chart. Uh, because uh, it it certainly is not behaving uh, like most of the other uh, growers right now. Uh, it's it's gotten caught up in this exuberance uh, from from folks, and uh, they're bidding it up. And it I, I guess it was kind of a highly shorted stock to begin with. It was, it was it definitely was part of that whole uh, field of play. I'm going to let Sean uh, add another comment at this point. Sean, uh, you have to unmute again. There you go. Got it. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, and Mark, we briefly talked about this actually, uh, that for a lot of the cannabis stocks, the federal employees and active military, well, any military in general, regardless of the, of the legality in, in their state, it's um, pretty much illegal for them to own um, cannabis stocks. So it can, once that, well, I imagine once something like this is um, is lifted to be able to invest in these stocks for the federal employees and, and military, that you might even see a bigger jump um, in these stock prices. Yeah, and that, to me, that's just an example of the the lingering confusion, you know, in the, when it comes to the legal side of marijuana. You know, I believe now we're up to, I don't even know the number of states where it's either de decriminalized or legal. And it's, it's just a, a very uh, fluid situation for sure. A lot of the dispensaries though, Mark, in a lot of these uh, uh, states where they've opened up and allowed recreational use, uh, the, the business isn't being done by these large uh uh, conglomerates of these large corporations. They're, they're being done by mom and pop operations. Uh, uh, I have firsthand knowledge from the point of view that in Michigan, when we opened up to recreational drug usage, marijuana usage, they allowed the towns and the cities and the townships to decide whether their dispensaries would be located within their borders. And so a lot of our geography opted out uh, of distribution and those that did opt uh, were suddenly inundated with very, very small uh, uh, med medicinal slash recreational uh, dispensaries. Uh, we have a stretch of highway uh, two miles from where I live. And on that stretch of highway in a three and a half mile stretch, there are 17 dispensaries. So uh, you can see what, what happens. The, the problem is that they're all operating on a cash basis. Right, they right. don't have access to the banking system. And that's causing uh, a lot of issues. There's, uh, it, it makes for a lot, of, uh, <laughs> a lot of inability to actually know how much uh, money is running through the business. Uh, because uh, there's there's no way to keep a uh, record of, of what the deposits uh, are in any way, shape, or form. You have to take everybody's word for it. And uh, even though the county, my county, made uh, half a, a million dollars from uh, recreational marijuana in the last tax year, uh, everybody is kind of certain that that's just the tip of the income iceberg as to what's happening. Yeah. Uh, and 100% with that, uh, I can imagine stock, you'll see a lot of uh, uh, bank stocks go through the roof as soon as they're, because they've been staying away from, from this stuff. So as soon as you, you see a like, federal legality on, hey, it's okay to, to do this stuff, you're going to see bank stocks go up because they're going to get a ton in fees uh, um, and profit for just for fees alone. And think how much it raised up in Colorado the very first year. Wasn't it like over a billion dollars with a B? that they raised just in the first year of marijuana um, legalization. 
I mean, think how think what that would do to translate if you did it across the U.S. and you included the banks in, in it and able to give out loans to, to businesses. Yeah, so it's, right now it's a huge thing. Are, the banks are afraid of losing their charters uh, if, in fact, something uh, like that would happen. So um, uh, I, I agree that until we get a federal ruling on on the legality and until it becomes legal everywhere with the states perhaps having the ability to control it like they do liquor, uh, I think you're you're going to have uh, this uh, ghost economy that exists right next to the real economy when it comes to to the marijuana trade. Yeah, very interesting. I, I mean, I can't imagine. I, I believe that every single dollar in cash that's uh, in these cash-based businesses gets reported for tax purposes. So um, that I'm being sarcastic. Um, there's, there's, <laughs> I have a. I have a comment from Dennis that I'm chuckling at, Mark. He says, probably a great economy out there. So anyhow, Ken, what I'm thinking is you know how, the, how the Traverse City uh, uh, wine company uh, country uh, has the these tasting things that you can go and do? I, I'm not sure that exists for the dispensaries, Mark. I'm not sure I can go in and... Well, and <laughs> I'm thinking you and I, I'll, I'll drive up, I'll bring, I'll bring some Dogecoin. <laughs> And we'll see if they'll accept Dogecoin, and we'll go on a on a test. Fill the back of the fill the back of the minivan with munchies, and we'll be all set. <laughs> okay. All right, uh, we got Dennis. To, we got Dennis has on. a comment. I'm going to give you just give you this comment because you'll you'll smile at it. Okay. He says, "Can everyone can everyone in the audience raise their hand uh, that who's okay with their airplane pilot smoking pot?" <laughs> <laughs> so. It's oh, that's, it's just that, one one viewpoint, Mark. Just one viewpoint. That, okay. that, could, that could go in a lot of different directions. All right, Ken, I'll turn yeah. it over to you to bring us back to uh, the realm of investment. Our information is going out. In fact, it went out to our uh, guest list about successful investing three. Uh, in uh, the next uh, uh, roundtable next Tuesday, and in the next bull session, we'll have actual dates and times uh, attached to this. Uh, section, but here's the classes that we're going to teach. Uh, we're going to be dealing with a uh, small company updating and searching for new ideas. Uh, we're going to do a, a class called From Theme to Target, identifying actionable ideas and, and trying to help people uh, uh, focus uh, a little bit on what they really want to invest in instead of coming up with such a general idea as EV, electronic vehicles, or infrastructure, but trying to get them to focus. We're going to talk about portfolio design and management, and, and we're going to uh, spend a little bit of time, again, talking about core versus non-core and uh, how a, a well-created, crafted portfolio uh, probably has room for both kinds of investments. Uh, Sai is doing a class called Stacking the Odds in Your Favor, and then we've put together a distinguished stock panel, uh, and we just hope that we can do half as well as we did at the last uh, successful investing conference in giving you great ideas for investing. Uh, our picks from uh, last, I don't know, it would be last November, last October, something like that, uh, were really uh uh, just sailing real high and doing a great job. So we'll bring those people back. We'll add a one or two more to the panel, and we'll try to give you some great ideas. All right, here's our reminder that you can access any of these sessions if you happen to miss them and you want to do some catch-up or share with a, a friend. Just go to YouTube and uh, search on Manifest Investing. You will be presented with all of the past programs. This is what you see if you actually click on that Videos tab. And they go back uh, the better part of 10 years now. I circled all the roundtables from the, the past three months just to make the point that all of the roundtables are, are also archived there, along with any educational themes or sessions that we do. And uh, just to make a point, the five sessions from May and November are uh, available there. And you can see that uh, you can take a look at those. Reminder that uh, the April roundtable is a week from today, uh, 8.30 Eastern time. And uh, I, as I was saying earlier, the internal rate of return on the tracking portfolio is up to 19.3, Ken. Uh, almost six, a relative return of six uh, percentage points to the market now. So good stuff.
my only regret, Mark, is that I didn't put in a uh, hundred bucks for every single choice we made all the way through the years. You know, it it would have been an interesting portfolio to look at, and it would have been an extremely uh, lucrative one as well. Well, my regret would be that I, I can't say that I did it and, and one up to you on it. Uh, I've invested in a few things, but not not as regularly as probably should have over the years. Yeah. All right. And we'll close with this picture. Any guesses as to what this is a picture of? Well, I see a palm tree. Is it somewhere down in Florida? You're, is it maybe Cuba? Warm, it is Cuba. That's actually Havana on the left, and I'm thinking cigars. And uh, I'm also thinking of that Cuba portfolio, if they actually began producing cannabis and products, what that would do to that situation. And, Sean Mace, that's your, your mission is to figure out how to make all these things happen so we can all get wealthy. <laughs> okay. Well, I just want to say good night to everybody then, and uh, thank you for coming, and we hope we see you at the roundtable next week. All right. Thanks, everybody.